So hi, I'm I'm Nicholas. I am in Perez. I uh, I I hack on code. Some of you know me. A lot of you know me. Um, I maintain a, a lot of modules um, working with Poe, um, specifically uh, Jabber stuff, uh, XML related uh, things like that. You can go and look at my modules. Um, and so, talking about uh, modern Perl for the uh, worker pattern. Um, you know, when you when you hear about uh, uh, modern Perl, you're thinking things like Moose. Uh, which you've got your meta object protocol, you've got uh, your roles, you've got your awesome extensibility, you know, all the good stuff that uh, Moose buys you. Um, I, I, I want to marriage that, and I, and I successfully have, I, I believe, uh, with Poe. So you can get asynchronous events, uh, it's embedded against many old and new platforms. Uh, it's extremely stable. Uh, Rocco takes very good care of it and makes sure that no one, no one you know, violates it. Too, too much. Um, and uh, it, it also, through you know, wheel, wheels and uh, those kinds of abstractions, you can have you know, uh, it all exist in a single process, or you can have it exist over multiple processes. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing, basically, is we're going to uh, be talking about the work pattern. Um, for those of you that come from a Java background or are familiar with, with uh, development patterns, uh, the worker pattern is uh, basically you have units of work and then you want to distribute them amongst um, various workers like in a factory, kind of that kind of setting, um, to basically execute the work and then return a result. Um, so uh, what you have, you, you, this is my wonderful ASCII art uh, here for diagrams. Um, did, you, did you do that by hand? I did by hand. I it's not NetHack? Net no, it's not NetHack. Oh. No, you missed that time. No, you were there. But, um, so you get win, you know, with this kind of pattern. Uh, it, it, it allows you to parallelize, did I say that right, uh, your work so that uh, you're able to uh, basically finish things faster. So what is it good for? What do you normally use it for? Um, long running tasks, uh, generating reports, um, uh, job queues, um, you know, those, those types of things that we have all been blessed with uh, having to write at one time or another. Um, hopefully you won't have to write it anymore, uh, and you can just use my tool. Um, even more modern or Perl, um, Moose X Declare. Who's familiar with Moose X Declare? Okay, um, Moose X Declare is uh, basically all sorts of sugary goodness um, put on top of Moose. Um, to basically give you a very strong declarative syntax so that you have things like uh, uh, actual method signatures um, so that you have uh, type constraint checking um, you can even decorate them very similar to attributes but with actual roles um, and you can have name positional and uh, invocant parameters which is very important to be able to uh, have a method signature um, and not having to do all of the parameter validation yourself. So it, it saves you a lot. Um, class and role blocks, so that you can actually declare a class and declare a role instead of just bare statements under the you know, package, you know, such and such role. Um, and uh, some other tools that, there's no tool that I wrote, um, MooseX compile time traits. Um, basically it lets you have, um, gives you the ability to consume traits at compile time so that you can, um, alter the behavior of code without having to um, actually edit the, those particular source files. I, I think Moose and, and, and roles in general really um, give you uh, this flexibility to um, make that kind of stuff happen you know, without having to monkey patch, without having to go in and edit someone else's source file and, and say, okay, well, we're just going to install this custom file and you know, oh, we'll handle the changes as they come from the upstream and that kind of stuff. That can just go away. You know, you can just apply the role and be done with it. Um, so, uh, POEX, I, just, I kind of went against community convention here and I decided to make another top level namespace um, to cover things like um, session instantiation. In, in POE, there is, a, you know, your concept of you have the kernel. Uh, and you have sessions, which are kind of your amalgamations of events. Um, 
that you know execute in a in a very stateful manner. Um, well, I, I want to to go a step further than the the session declaration, and I wanted to um, basically give you a mechanism for um, turning your Moose objects into post sessions, um, so that it was very transparent. You know, you you would just kind of decorate your your Moose object, and it would magically uh, work within Poe. Um, so uh, some of the differences between um, other things that try and accomplish this, um, I know that uh, uh, Chris Prather, uh, Peregrine, uh, also has a, um, a similar module trying to accomplish the same thing. Uh, his is uh, Moose X Po, that's, that's the name of it. And uh, his is, is much more delving into the, um, into the meta classes and uh, basically producing the, the syntax and, and arguments for post session, uh, whereas this actually will provide the implementation of the session hidden behind the scenes. Um, and we'll see examples of all of this. I just kind of wanted to go through uh, and, and cover the core technology that the, my module makes use of. Um, if you attended, um, if you attended Sean's talk earlier, uh, he made mention of PubSub. And um, I also implement a, a similar uh, concept of using Poe um, to basically allow you to have a uh, simple message system uh, to be able to have, um, to be able to subscribe and publish a, a events. And Poe, you know, you are sending messages and you're, you're, you're sending, you're basically executing events, you know, asynchronously from one session to another. Um, Sometimes it's difficult to communicate to another session that, hey, I want you to call this event back. You know, now you can use postbacks, you can use callbacks, and you can you can execute within that manner. I, I tend to want to avoid all of the um, all of the extra references that get uh, basically captured when you're making the closures for the postbacks and things, and just use strings. You know, just just manage it by the event name itself. You subscribe to it, you you uh, publish to it, um, and that's what that's what Poet PubSub provides. Um, so, uh, so it combines the best of, of uh, Moose and Poe, and uh, every faucet is is very uh, easily customizable because I'm using the compile time uh, uh, traits, and it makes implementing a worker solution easier, which is the point. So let's take a look at some code. Um, so what we have here is uh, we, we are um, we have a job. And we have declared our job with, uh, uh, th this is the Moose X declare uh, syntax. It looks really funky, I know, if you're, if you're not accustomed to it. Um, so what we're, what we're doing here is we're saying that uh, this class is going to consume this role. Dude, Moose X declare gives you scripts and wall names. I, well, I know. But, but I'm executing further code down here. So I wanted to... So it covers the entire scope. The for the class scope itself, it's it's inside Curly's. Uh, yeah, but the script and warnings comes in at the top level. It's actually imported at the top level. I'm mm -hmm. sure it is. Because I could have sworn they were they were lexical. Uh, right, but if you do it if you do it at the top of the file. If you do it at the top of the file, right. Which you did. Which I that's did. Where you use Correct. Your text to Correct. So I'm not seeing the problem there. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. So with our with our job, um, what Poet's worker pool role job provides uh, is basically the mechanism for you to um, for your job class to be successfully consumed and used within uh, Poet's worker pool. Um, if you're not familiar with Musex Moose role build instance of, it's fantastic for cutting out um, a lot of boilerplate that you would need to use to basically instantiate an instance, um, do all of the lazy build and do all of the, the type checking and all of that stuff. So you can just provide arguments to it and say, here's the class I want you to instantiate and give it this prefix and you suddenly have an accessor available in your class. It's magical. It's awesome. Um, so what we're doing is we're setting up using log dispatch uh, a log prefix and we just want to dump it out to a file. 
Uh, we have another attribute here, which is, of course, just like regular Moose, uh, has message, uh, is read-only, string, and uh, required. So basically, we, we want our job uh, to do a couple of things here. Um, the API for, um, for the actual uh, job role is that you have to provide uh, an init job method. Uh, and what this lets you do is it lets you um, initialize the, the job uh, in instance on the other side of the process boundary. So the way that, um, that uh, POEX worker pool works is that it spins up, it spins up these uh, workers and they exist uh, in, on both sides of the process boundary. So you've got the abstraction that manages the whole wheel run uh, which then you know spawns something else that's actually going to shut down Poe and start up another uh, another uh, loop on the other side. Um, so if you have resources that are hard to you know send across, like for example database handles, you know you don't want to fork and have database handles you know accessible from both. You don't want to have to th those types of things. So what you would do is you would open new database handles from from the other side of the process, and that's what this particular method is good for. Um, so uh, in this, we're not doing anything fancy. We're just gonna we're just gonna log, um, and this may look a little funky here, but it's um, actually to make sure that we're not um, closing over self. So here's our runner class, um. and uh, our runner class is gonna use a couple of different modules and do different things. Now, um, this is actually. Right here, the session instantiation that I was talking about. Um, so we got some logging, and we got our actual worker pool instance that we're looking at. Um, but this line right here, you can see. Let me use my laser pointer. Um, right here, you basically have a um, you have a, a method modifier, and you have uh, is event. It's like what is that? That's really strange. Um, what that is, is that I'm saying that this method has this um, role, this trait to it. Uh, this is something that uh, I worked with Florian to uh, do because it was, uh, it's neat because behind the scenes for session instantiation, um, I'm doing a lot of introspection and this lets me know that this event is actually exposed to Poe, that this method is exposed to Poe so that when it's doing dispatch, it knows that Hey, I'm going to actually send this send this method, uh, and the and the uh, method uh, advice right here after uh, the modifier. Um, it it already comes with an underscore start, um, which is you know very typical typical post session stuff. Um, but this lets other people have other starts as well. You know, either they can advise it themselves or or whatever, and that this will this will execute in the after after scope. Um, so uh, what we're doing is we're going to basically subscribe the worker, which in and of itself is going to make use of the pub, pub sub component, which you know comes by default. Um, this method uh, subscribe the worker the the enqueue job from the pool itself will return an alias, you know, to the actual session that the, the pub sub component uh, lives at. And we're going to use that alias to then do calls to do subscriptions to the events that are listed here and what event handler should be called when, um, you know, we're, we're basically subscribing to that event. So when that event happens, we're going to get notified of it. Um, and the events that we're, you know, interested in are things like workers starting their processing, a job's been dequeued, a job's been enqueued, job start, job complete, job progress. You basically, and there's even more events that, I, like all the failure events and things that you can possibly be, you know, notified of, that you can subscribe to. Um, so, you know, for the for all these events, all we're doing is logging, just to say, hey, look, it's actually happened. And then once, you know, for stop processing, um, as soon as we have enough worker stops, which is basically after all of our jobs have uh, been enqueued or dequeued, um, hits 50, then we'll just go ahead and halt. Um, and that's and that's the that's a, a very simple example. I know it looks a little a little long in the tooth, but I wanted to make sure that everything was was demonstrated. Um, 
and then we can actually, no, 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 not that. Uh, I can run this, if I can remember. No, that's not in here. Ingi's broom thing is supposed to let me run this. So let's just do it the easy way here. So it's, uh, it's executing at this point, and we can then turn around and You can see it's actually logging out all of what jobs and what messages and all the various steps and everything that's currently happening um, for all the processes and things like that. And then if we wanted to look and see what processes were, were spun up, you can see that it's we've got a whole bunch of pearls that are actually executing. And so here's our notifications on how complete you know, a particular job is. With, walk, with, the, with particular workers. We have a, a UUID that we're using for the job, uh, the job ID. And we stop processing. Awesome. So, moving on. Uh, how it's broken down. Uh, for, for POEX worker pool uh, into several discrete pieces. Um, you actually have the pool itself, uh, which is typically how you would make use of it. You can actually get underneath it and get a hold of the workers themselves. Um, uh, and, you know, they, they, again, they've got the abstraction that they're on both sides of the process, you know, and they communicate back and forth um, using uh, Ho filter reference in between. Uh, so we're, we're sending data structures back and forth messages uh, to know what, what type of event has occurred in, in its context. Um, and it uses the pub sub component to you know, publish all of the events that could you know, possibly happen. Uh, guts is actually the, the implementation for the sub process on, you know, on the other side. Um, it works in steps and provides facilities um, like we were talking about with a knit job so that you could pull up database handles, you can uh, instantiate your logging, you can do all of that stuff so um, you're not going to have any any forked issues because that's ultimately how whole, whole wheel run works is by forking. Um, and then you have a loader too, so if you needed to do something funky, um, the actual invocation of uh, making the guts come to life, uh, you can actually uh, advise the various steps uh, in making that happen and uh, the documentation that will explain that a little bit more. Um, types, so um, making use of uh, MUSEX types, uh, so for convenience types for uh, interacting with it, uh, a number of error classes uh, for all the error states. One of the things I like to use is uh, try catch uh, or even uh, try tiny. Um, and your, all the methods will, if there's a particular error state, it will throw. Uh, an exception. It will die, basically. And so you need to catch it and you need to handle it and deal with it. Such as when you enqueue a job and the queue is full, you know, you, you, you got to manage that somehow. Uh, so the exceptions are, are, are very much a part of it. Um, and I know in, in, in Poe it's, it can be a little difficult to manage exceptions um, that happen in your event handlers. So, for example, in the worker and also in the sub-process, those are captured and it sets up the die handler and everything for you, and then it notifies you through PubSub. So that way you know specifically where the, where the signal came from and what the particular context was. Um, so let's talk about uh, customization a little bit here. Um, pretty much with uh, compile time traits, you just simply use it with the trait argument and uh, all of that will uh, happen for you. Uh, you can also jump through hoops and do some special things here. So, um, let's say we wanted to provide some extra initialization uh, for the um, for the guts before they got loaded. So we'd want to basically take the guts loader and we would want to um, advise build main uh, to basically take a code ref. Um, this particular syntax here is uh, particular to uh, a parameterized role. So when you use the role itself, um, 
you are providing, you're going to provide that code rep right there, and uh, this will then get injected into build main. Uh, so we have the original, and then we'll see we're going to execute load before we execute code. And uh, here we are using it. Um, normally it would be something, something simple to do, but for this particular case, we wanted to um, make sure that our extra init happens um, after it's already been instantiated. You know, we, we wanted, we wanted to, ha to handle the case of after start. Uh, so for this, we want to make sure that uh, the class is loaded, uh, then we're going to go ahead and call import on it manually with the particular trait that we want. Um, and uh, using the, um, basically providing the, the argument that we wanted for the post workloader. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much what that looks like. So uh, you see we're, we're using the extends, that's more MooseX declare um, syntax for subclassing. Um, and this would let us at runtime basically to make changes um, that we need to make changes to. So that's, that's the end. I probably talked really fast. How does the, uh, the serialization of database handles across the, the void work? It doesn't. It doesn't. No, no, you say when you try, what happens when you try to do that? DBI does not like it when you have forked handles. It will complain because it's not thread safe at uh, all. The, yeah, if you use DBI's connector. You can use connector. Because theory has, theory has kindly extracted the DBH handling logic from DBIC. Right. Uh, we're not porting DBI's class across to it yet. Right. But it's basically the same code. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's pretty fucking bad. So when you're in your intro, I was saying that was when you were mentioning lots of things not to do. Okay. Yes. But uh, so you and you're just using po filter reference to to send data back and forth. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the, the data structure is extremely simple. I just had a really horrible thought. What is your horrible you, thought? I uh, wouldn't quite work. I was thinking you could use file fd parser to shove the um, socket for the DBH across to a sub-process, but of course you wouldn't have the driver state on the other side at the C level, so it wouldn't like it. Right. Which is a bit of a shame. Right. Because that would have been fucking cool. So I'm at barriers. Oh, there is. Apparently I've had a network issue. So... Yeah. I'll tell you that yes, if you're using Pobox. Yes, I do use Pobox. Dude, have you met the council word there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Gotcha>. Ricardo. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, and if you're interested about this, I, I do use this for work. Um, we, we specifically needed um, a job queue for producing, you know, a crap ton of reports. And to do it in, in a parallel manner, because the old system... That was the one that was using the sex workers, right? Some, moose sex workers? Well, yeah, I don't know if it was using moose sex workers. <laughs> um, no, 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 no. This one, this one was, was replacing the, the uh, cron job oh, okay. that was spinning up. So we had, a, we had a cron job that was spinning up every minute to pull a database and do a whole bunch of crap and generate, generate these reports. Well, the problem was is that you would end up with overlapping yeah. Because it because it got to, because the execution time was getting so long because of all the you know new startup time issues that can can be an issue issues and issues um, so we wanted something that would be persistent in memory so we wouldn't have that we wouldn't have that performance hit on startup uh, and this was this was what fell out of it uh, working working with this specifically how difficult do you think it would be to do multi stage jobs. Not hard at all. That, 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 that's part of it. The, the, but you can have multiple steps, and you can enqueue those multiple steps, and it's dependent on how you, how you set up the class. And in fact, um, if you saw in the... We can back up a little here. You can see here that we are instantiating the job. I may need to scroll over or even put a line break in here. 
for instantiating the job with arguments. Um, so you could you could theoretically say you know how many steps you want, and you can even give them classes for executing for the sub steps to you know instantiate those or however you wanted to do it, and it would it would report. Do I have control on the client side about what it does with the job object? Absolutely. Because what I'm, what I'm thinking, the thing is, I've got something that's um, about 15 steps. Mm -hmm. Normally, it can run straight through them. Uh -huh. Some of the time, it gets three steps through and goes, hang on a minute, I need to ask for something. Yeah. At which point, what I want to do is leave the job object in the child process. Okay. And have, once I've got that data for it, be able say, to, to say, <clears throat> resume that in the same child. Presumable jobs. See, I haven't, I haven't gotten that far, but I don't, I don't see what the problem would be. You would have to, you would have to do some customization inside the worker, uh, at, at least in the guts, you know, on the on the sub process on the other side to hold state, um, and communicate back that it needs more information or whatever. You could, you could probably set up, you could set up a custom message type and then respond to it. And yeah. subscribe to well, it. I guess what I, what I really want is to have jobs shoved into um, workers, and then once it's in the worker, I can pretty much self-manage. I can just have a main loop that either accepts a new job or resumes an old one, depending on what sort of message it gets. Yes, um, because you can bypass the pool itself. The pool is basically, all it does is, is house the workers, and um, it, it gives you some, some semantics for doing like round robin or um, until the worker is full to then give you another one. Um, so, but, but you can you can get rid of that altogether, and you could manage how you want the workers to process your jobs altogether. Um, I know in our in our work app, we're pull, I'm pulling a database, and I'm, I'm pulling the workers out specifically which ones that I want uh, to then load up with jobs based on you know either how heavy the queue, I'm doing my own load balancing basically for jobs versus how many workers I have. Um, which is probably micro-optimization. I probably don't need to go to that detail. Um, because I, we're only spinning up like maybe five processes. Um, but for, for gaining more control, um, you could do it because the the actual implementation details for all of this stuff exist in roles, and so the, the classes are just shells that consume the implement, implementation role. So you could you could even apply more roles that do more things with it, and override the default behaviors very easily. I have to dig through the sources and type. Yeah. Um. And this is meant as a controlling, kind of, kind of like a controlling work pool on one machine. It doesn't do across machine. Mm -hmm. Not yet. That would be that would be part of the proxy session stuff that mm -hmm. I I did for Yapsing. That I would I would like to continue work on. In fact, yeah, kind of, it's kind of like a, an IKC type thing, but different. Exactly. And and Matt and I needed to talk about meta class serialization because what I'm doing now to make the proxy sessions work is basically doing my own introspection and sending over a data structure that's interpreted on the other side to then recreate the session. Um, it would be easier if we could just send the session wholesale the meta class for it completely across the wire and have it just, you know, re reinstated on the other side. Yeah, you don't need them you don't need the meta bodies, but it would be incredibly handy to have the signatures. Exactly. That's that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Mm, this reminds me of my pet part project that I should work on at some point. I want to do a type map between loose types and uh, dbus. Interesting. Because there's, I current most I want to be a client right now for D, different dbus apps, and mm -hmm. there's the dbus module in CPAN which implements its own type signature stuff. Okay. It's a piece of crap. Dbus is. Dbus is actually not really it's, that bad. It's just the interface for it's horrible. Well, there is no interface. I mean, it's the lack of interface for it's quite horrible. Right. If you have anything that's like, oh, we can figure through Dbus, it's like, great. I have some horrible little 
useless uh, shell command, and then I got to put in you know a, a, uh, an eight hundred character string to configure things. Honestly, it's actually very easy to use Dbus from C, and it's not that hard from Python. The bindings are are pretty good. It's just you need to be able to uh, introspect quite a lot. Yeah. Right, but no, but no, no poor people have really cared about it because it hasn't been declared dead yet, so obviously it isn't stable. So Unix has been declared dead about 27 times. C keeps being declared dead. It'll Unix never be declared dead. It will never gets declared dead. I really want C++ to actually physically be dead. <laughs> no, man, C++ is good. I like it. Especially standard template. Which, which, which standard section? template library is good. The okay, the template library, template libraries are nice. So I was thinking about the, the weird object oriented stuff they try to throw in. The, the, uh, the templates outside of the object. Like, what, what, what bothers you about the, the OO in, in C? The inflexibility of it, the fact that it's not. Inflexibility? The, I mean, fact you can have... obje- the fact that it's not Objective C. Oh, please. Objective C is ugly. C- why would you, C++ why would you compare the two? C++ OO only really comes into its own if you're in the situation where you actually understand that you can write your own allocator and initializer and stuff and swap out parts of the mechanics of the object system yes. and do that in a way that is optimal for your application. Yes. Um, I, our system admin wrote a quick C++ thing for doing an onward launch of programs and just replaced it with an allocator that was basically a studio, studio style string allocator. Mm-hmm which completely simplified the object implementation and made the fucker way easier to debug. Right. You can't do that in um, something like a, in something like Objective-C. Objective-C makes the simple cases a lot simpler. Mm-hmm. Um, C++ lets you get into the guts. The, the, the Objective-C versus C++ is kind of like um, my first Ruby program versus Devil Declare. <laughs> you they're not comparable, and if you try and treat one as the other, you're going to yeah. fucking hate it. I just don't really like the I just don't really like C plus type system. I think would probably the correct statement. I like the templating system though. But, but trying, I don't trying like to treat C plus plus as anything other than a low level object engine contru- construction toolkit yep. works about the same way as treating PHP with anything but fire. Yes, is Lucas in here? I have a question. And yes. Like, retreat, that's, I listen because I can kind of catch a stream, but even very basically, would you mind doing like a extemporaneous on Poe itself, just in general? So uh-huh. who uses that, uses it for what? This is kind of the component. Oh, um, well, the, the, the man of Poe himself is standing, sitting, sitting, sitting. right there. Our, our, the main author, the, 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 oh, yeah. the man who says yay or nay to patches is right there. He might like hearing what you think. Um, well, <laughs> the thing is, I use it for just about anything that, that requires any type of asynchronous communication. You know, managing managing events, network communication, network servers, running my mud engines. Yeah, that, that. So I mean, it, it's that's the kind of stuff you end up using it for. Um, there is a lot of people that would say that they would prefer to use something like any event or even Coro or uh, some something other that can give you the the same benefits. But Po gives you a very solid API. Um, it's it's very um, well tested. It's very it's very well defined, uh, and I would prefer that over something like any event because you end up recreating those abstractions uh, that Poe provides for you in any event, anyways. After you reach a certain point of complexity, because you're going to want to sim- you're you're going to want to wrap up and codify you know the way that you're handling things in any event, anyhow. Um, but specifically, I know that I've written um, XML routers in Poe. I've written um, various types of other network servers, an SMTP server and client implementation. Um, IRC bots. People love for IRC bots. It's kind of a rite of passage that you have to have an IRC bot. Then you have to write a framework. A framework for writing IRC bots like uh, Adam and, and Moses. Adam and Moses, yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's that's Poe. I like it. I like it a lot. And 
with with the the stuff that I've, that I'm doing with it with Moose, I I like the direction that it's going um, because there's a whole bunch of other people that are also doing the same thing, that are combining the two and and making it extremely useful. Um, Pearl Six, does it affect you at all? Do you have any? No. If Matt's not in here, so I'll just say Florin Vapor Six. Pretty much, it's. It, it is an interesting research project in which valuable ideas have been uh, absorbed back into Perl 5, um, but it's not anywhere you, near production ready. And in fact, I did a test of it a few months ago. You know, I, I documented my, my, my travels of uh, trying to implement uh, or even port a, a naive, I do a naive port of Poe to Perl 6. And they don't even have the I.O. layer done at all. It just doesn't exist. You, you can't even select over, you know, a bunch of sockets. You know, you select just doesn't work. It's, and so it's, it's very difficult to say that, oh, you know, this is, this is good stuff and, you know, we can use it in our enterprise and all that. When, when you can't even do the basic rudimentary I.O. things that, you know, people take for granted. I mean, it's just how can you not have the, the, that kind of stuff in... in it's because they're fiddling with all the interesting things. You know, implementing select is not interesting. You know, having you know coroutines and continuations, continue, yeah, yeah, and and all of that stuff happening, and all of, it's real complex, and that's that's really cool and good for them. You know, and rewriting the the compiler. You know, this is what the third time the, with NQ, the next what I don't know what the what. You're right. Shot's been you're right. It's a number, at least. I think it's number three. Yeah, they, they, they're on the third third try of trying to get a compiler right. Larry will not call this, this the specification final at all because there's large swaths of it that just aren't finished. I mean, they're, they're just at some point there needs to be a, a just fucking do it attitude and just say this is what the spec is going to be for one dot, and then turn around and, and say, well, here were the limitations of it. Now here's one dot one. And that way you can have compilers and runtimes and whatever else say, we are conformant to spec 1.0, we are conformant to spec 1.1, just like every other fucking language on the face of the earth. And, you know, C has it, Java has it. Uh, I don't understand why, why they can't just stop and say, okay, these are the set of features we want for 1.0 and just, you know, we're going to just pick something arbitrary for now. And if people bitch about it and they don't like it, then we can go back and change it. You know, it, it's at some point they need to settle and they need to just just do it. And that's that's the that's the real unfortunate thing because it there are a lot of there's a lot of cool things in Pearl Six. It's it is some of the some of the the condensing of Pearl Five idioms into Pearl Six are very impressive. It's an extremely expressive language uh, that is. Very, very context knowledgeable, and you don't have the same kinds of ambiguities that you could potentially have in Perl Five. Uh, in a lot of instances, um, it's object system, it's roles, it's types, it's all of that stuff. It's really good, and it, it will be solid when they can finally release it. Um, and it will likely be performant very quickly once they get to a point where they're they're it's production ready. And I know Chromatic would be all up and down the, the walls saying, oh, well, you can't say production ready. We do releases every month and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. You, know, you do a release every month, but where's the I.O. layer? So your release included you know, pod fixes. Okay, fantastic. That's awesome. How does that, how does that help me, how does that help me you know, do, do real work with it? So there's my take on Perl 6. And there are people with much more eloquent opinions than what I have. So, there you have it. Thank you. What time is it?